As someone who was evacuated from the House floor and described January 6th as a dark day in the history of America, I wonder if you share those concerns about political violence around this election. No, I don't think the, there's going to be political violence this election. I think that uh, you know what the concerns in the last election, unfortunately, were pertaining to mailing uh, universal ballots and uh, who was voting these people. I mean, I live in Appalachia, and we every election that's ever been contested in the history of, of uh, Southeast Kentucky pertain to loose absentee balloting rules. And, and I think now the uh, balloting rules have been tightened. Uh, there's no COVID, so there's no need to mail uh, universal ballots to every registered voter on the voter list in America. If you want an absentee ballot, then vote absentee. My daughter's going to vote absentee because uh, she's going to be uh, on a vacation during that time, uh, a long vacation. So uh, request the ballot. And I think that that was the problem with the last election. That's why so many Republicans were concerned about uh, the integrity of our voting. Uh, I believe that's been solved. I'm confident that uh, the states of Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona, where the where the most questions arose the last election, I'm confident those those problems have been solved, and I'm confident there's going to be okay. a peaceful transfer of power. Well, Mr. Chairman, you may believe that about the actual changing from President Biden to President whomever. But we have already seen political violence in this election cycle with the attempted assassination of Donald Trump last month. Oversight obviously launched an investigation into that. What's next for the committee and how does it dovetail with the bipartisan task force that has now been mm -hmm. set up by the speaker and Democratic leader? I think what the bipartisan task force is going to do is try to determine the exact failures, uh, who's to blame, uh, they're going to focus in on the shooter, did the shooter act alone, those sorts of things. Where my committee has legislative jurisdiction is over the Secret Service. And and this committee uh, has had a long history of investigating the Secret Service, dating back to Elijah Cummings and, and Jason Chaffetz when they were chair. There's been a concern for over a decade in the Oversight Committee by Republicans and Democrats that the Secret Service was lax in their training requirements and their hiring requirements. And they had always had a, a bad scorecard with respect to morale among government employees. So uh, we want to fix the problem. We look forward to hearing what the bipartisan task force concludes. And we want to try to make sure that this never happens again. Well, I want President Biden to be safe. I want Paula Harris to be safe. And I want Donald Trump to be safe, and we shouldn't have to worry about that. But right now, I don't think very many people have confidence that the Secret Service uh, can protect those people. So we want to fix the problem, and that's the role the House Oversight Committee will play. Well, I know that you're busy on the Oversight Committee with this matter, uh, Congressman. I wonder if you're planning to pursue, as has been reported, uh, the idea of sending a subpoena to Kamala Harris or other members of the Biden administration for covering up, as it's been suggested, Joe Biden's mental acuity that mm -hmm. led him out of this race? Well, we certainly believe there was a cover-up. I don't think anyone's ever said anything about subpoenaing the vice president or anything like that. We have subpoenaed staffers. We've identified three staffers as well as the White House position that we believe, according to press reports in the New York Times and other mainstream media outlets, uh, were the ones that were the gatekeepers, the ones that were protecting Joe Biden from meeting with his cabinet, the ones that were shielding Joe Biden from the press, the ones that were escorting Joe Biden uh, on and off the, the plane and in and out of the White House. Uh, we want to see uh, exactly when the president's health started deteriorating and exactly what they did to try to conceal that. So uh, I don't think any very many people in America would dispute the fact that the president has been in uh, declining health. The question is for how long? And the big concern in our committee is, was there a shadow government? Is Joe, Joe Biden uh, incoherent completely? We don't, we don't know. But if so, was the, who was calling the shots? Is the, was there a shadow government? I think that's an issue of national security. And I think that's a question that a lot of Americans in both parties have. Do you have enough evidence of that, sir, that we will actually see a hearing in regard to this matter? Is there enough there? How does it move forward? Well, we're certainly uh, hoping that uh, the White House staffers will honor their subpoena. Uh, I assume that that'll be going to court. We have a lot of subpoenas outstanding that uh, that are unfortunately uh, slow walking, being slow walked through court. Uh, so certainly this is something that uh, we're not going to let up on. We certainly want to know exactly uh, what circumstances evolved around 
the 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 concealment of the president's poor health. Mm-hmm. And certainly, you know, you look at the doctor. The doctor issued a statement just a few months prior uh, to Joe Biden dropping out of the the presidential election, stating that he was in perfect health. And I think we've seen Nancy Pelosi and other leaders who have regularly met with Joe Biden say, no, he's not in good enough health. He's not in good enough health to to serve four more years as president. So uh, we have a lot of questions and and hopefully uh, our subpoenas will be upheld in in the courts now, because every subpoena I've Mm -hmm. issued, to my knowledge, in the private sector has been honored. The subpoenas that I have trouble with are the ones in the Biden administration. This has not been a transparent administration, and uh, I'm not going to shed too many tears in January when they uh, when they walk out of the White House. Well, and of course, we don't have evidence of a cover up here, but we do want to hear what you learn, uh, Mr. Chairman. At the same time, I wonder if if you're not going to subpoena Kamala Harris on that issue. Do you, in fact, want to question the vice president about her role as the so-called borders are in this administration? Mm-hmm. We have a lot of questions. I mean, the so-called borders are was what Joe Biden called her, the borders are. So, uh, you know, I don't think anyone... Well, it's not an dispute. official title. I think we understand each other. Well, I, I, don't, I don't agree with that. I believe she is the borders are. And at the, at the end of the day, uh, the southern border is a disaster. Uh, we've had a wide open border for the entire four years. Uh, people are invited to come to the United States uh, without any consequences when they, when they come over here illegally. And, and I think that uh, that's bad. I think that's been a drain on the taxpayers, on, on Medicaid, on uh, our, our public health, on on uh, our, our crime. Fentanyl certainly has poured into this country across the southern border. So we want to know who, who's to blame for that because we've got to fix the southern border. So uh, with respect to subpoenas, I've never said anything about subpoenaing the vice president or the president. It's very difficult to subpoena the president or vice president. I would hope that the media... Uh, will question Kamala Harris about what exact role she played on the border and why she didn't step up to secure the border. If she wasn't the border czar, she was still vice president. Why didn't she uh, express outrage or concern that uh, millions and millions of people were, were walking across the border illegally? Well, we do hope we'll have the chance to ask some questions of the vice president at some point here on Bloomberg, Congressman, and Mr. Chairman. But obviously, we get to ask questions of you now. I would like to focus on one thing in particular that you put out before the recess. It was a report on the three big PBMs, pharmacy benefits mm-hmm. managers. Obviously, there have been a lot of bipartisan ideas as to how to overhaul PBMs. What legislatively do you think we can expect, if anything, from this Congress? Are these companies that need to be broken up? Absolutely. I, I, I strong, I'm a Republican. I'm all about making money. I'm a conservative. I believe uh, the government needs to get off the backs of the private sector. But we've got a problem with pharmaceutical uh, prices in America. Uh, people that need prescription drugs are having to pay too much for prescription drugs. I think that's a, a somewhere where we have bipartisan agreement. The PBMs are, are called their pharmacy benefit managers were created to be the middleman, to created to help negotiate the price of drugs to make drugs mm-hmm. cheaper. But what's happened over time is the PBMs have been purchased by the insurance companies who have purchased the pharmaceutical, uh, the, the, the pharmacies now. So they're vertically integrated and they're actually gouging consumers as opposed to saving consumers money. And we believe that the, these PBMs need to be broken up. We believe they need to uh, be held accountable for overbilling Medicare, Medicaid. You're seeing states uh, blue states and red states alike uh, passed legislation to rein in the PBMs, and I think that Congress should do a lot more. We have jurisdiction on the Oversight Committee with the federal health insurance plan. We've already passed legislation reining in the PBMs on the federal health insurance plan, but the, the two committees of jurisdiction that have broad jurisdiction over reining in the PBMs altogether are the House uh, Ways and Means Committee and the House Energy and Commerce Committee. They've yet to do a whole lot on PBMs. And, and our investigation, I think, has shined a lot on the abuses. That's that report that we issued. Katie Porter, uh, Raj Cristamorte, these are Democrat members from uh, California and Illinois, respectively. They were all in with us on this investigation, on this report. It's very bipartisan. And we believe that the PBMs are one reason that healthcare is unaffordable in the United States.